It's always a special privilege on these baccalaureate services to hear from some of our graduating seniors. And we have the opportunity tonight to hear from three who will give testimonies to us. First of all, Bonnie Hatcher, who was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. She's traveled and lived in several countries, including France, Gambia, West Africa, and Israel. Bonnie received her Bachelor of Science from Stockton University in New Jersey, a Master of Science from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, an MA in Biblical History and Geography from Jerusalem University College in Israel. Bonnie accepted Christ as her savior at the age of 11. She received her initial call to ministry 24 years later while conducting business in Sierra Leone. Shortly thereafter, the Lord sent her to Gambia, where he clarified her call to preach and teach his word as she ministered to refugees from Sierra Leone. Upon returning to the U.S., Bonnie recognized that she had a zeal of God, or for God, but lacked knowledge, and therefore began formal preparation for ministry, first at Jerusalem University College, and then here at Gordon-Conwell. She believes that the Lord will use her business experience and entre entrepreneurial spirit as a tent maker on the mission field and possibly serving as a pastor of a church in West Africa, ministering to former children of war. Following graduation with the Master of Divinity from the Hamilton campus, Bonnie will be pursuing a THM in preaching at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland beginning this fall. That made possible by her receipt of the highest award in preaching that we give at Gordon-Conwell. Second, we will have the opportunity to hear from David Wright. David was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, a true Bostonian, I assume a true Red Sox fan. And when I looked, they were beating the Yankees before we came down. <laughs> David holds a Bachelor of Arts with honors from Harvard University and a Doctor of Jur Jurisprudence from Harvard Law School. He felt a call to ministry since he was a teenager, but he rejected for a long time that call. He grew up around ministers and had ministers as close friends and mentors. He saw their life of dedication and sacrifice, but decided he wanted a different path. And so he went into a law, a field that required some of the same basic skills, similar stress, and a lot more money. <laughs> In that pursuit, as David put it, he was miserable beyond belief. But in the year 2000, he re recommitted his life to the Lord, and that eventually led him to our Boston campus. After graduation, he plans, first of all, to catch up on some sleep. And after that, he will continue his education in the THM program and continue to serve as the assistant pastor to the Reverend Dr. Wesley Roberts at the, Peace, at the People's Baptist Church in Boston. And then thirdly, we have the opportunity to hear from one of the gentlemen we just introduced from Haiti, Joel Lawa. Joel was born and raised in Haiti. After high school, he went to Bible school, which is now the seminary of evangelical theology of Port-au-Prince, often referred to as STEP. After four years of study there, he received a scholarship from Dallas Theological Seminary and received the THM from Dallas. His interest in ministry began while he was in high school. He'd been raised in a Christian home by parents who encouraged him to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Even before entering Bible school, he was convinced that the Lord wanted him to be involved in full-time church ministry. After graduation with the Doctor of Ministry, he will continue with his teaching and preaching ministry in Haiti, where he's been a pastor and a seminary professor for more than 20 years. Following the student reflections, we will then have a special music by one of our graduates, Rebecca Mongo, and then the hearing of the Word of God, the scripture reading from Rebecca Rowlands. Bonnie, we welcome you. To President Hollinger, to Dean Lentz, to Dean Williams, 
to the faculty and to all my brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Tonight, I believe that the Lord wants me to encourage you to rejoice for your hour has come. In John 16 and 21, as Jesus was bidding his disciples farewell, he used an illustration of a woman in labor to illustrate that the very thing that caused you sorrow can become the object of your joy. Paraphrasing, Jesus said, when a woman is in travail, she has sorrow for her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of that baby, she remembers no more her distress because a child is born into the earth and for her sorrow is turned into joy. Like a woman in travail, you have labored in seminary, but tonight, <laughs> You can rejoice because the Lord says your hour has come. Yes, yes, you can rejoice tonight, yes. So the word travail is not a word that we use in our everyday language, but travail simply means a painful and difficult labor. The process of travailing is associated with such words as agony and weeping, anguish and distress. Sounds like my time at seminary, what about yours? <laughs> yes. So think back to when you first arrived to, at Gordon-Conwell and you were pregnant. You were pregnant with the vision that God had placed in you. You were pregnant with the call of God upon your life. And then that hour came when you were in great agony as you struggled to write your first exegesis paper and you didn't have a clue of what to do. <laughs> or perhaps it was when you labored all week long studying it for an exam and you were confident that you were going to do well. And then you received the results that caused you to weep and bitter anguish all night long. Sisters and brothers, in those hours, you were in travail. But thank God we didn't have to travail by ourselves because God gave us midwives, yes. They are our family and friends that have prayed for us and labored with us and supported us financially. They are our spiritual mentors, such as my mentor back in New York, Reverend Margaret, who faithfully every more Monday morning around 11 a.m., she would listen to me lamenting about the difficulties of the process of seminary training. But the wonderful thing about Reverend Margaret is by the end of the conversation, I was convinced and in agreement that God's grace was sufficient to carry me through. Our midwives are our well-seasoned professors who not only labored with us to teach us how to rightly divide the word of truth, but they have also prayed with us and sometimes even wept with us. For many of us, it was Lita, our former dean of students, whose door was always open by 7.30 in the morning, and we know we can go in and that she would pray for us and that she would remind us of the faithfulness of God, and we didn't leave her office until our tears were dried and we were convinced that we can make it another day. So Father, we thank you for all of our midwives, all of our family members and our professors that have prayed with us. And on behalf of all of my co-laborers here, I say to our midwives, thank you. And I invite you to rejoice for your hour has come, the hour in which you can see the fruitfulness of your labor with us. So tomorrow, when we receive our diplomas, it will be a great day of joy. And joy is the supernatural response that comes when we yield our emotions over to the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is not an emotion. 
It is a state of being that so it, it provokes a celebratory reaction at seeing the work of God. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that we will have joy tomorrow, not because of our abilities nor because of our accomplishments. We will have joy because of what we receive from God through this process. We have learned that the process did not come to destroy us, but it came to mature us. We have learned that God is so faithful to his word and to his promise that he would never leave us nor forsake us no matter how difficult the challenge. As a God of all grace, we learn that he is faithful to extend to us whatever grace we need when we need it. But most of all, God is faithful that even when we are unfaithful, he remained faithful. This is why we're gonna to rejoice tonight. This is why we have joy. In closing, I wanna leave you with this last word of encouragement. And that is that another hour of travail is coming. It's coming again. You can bet your last dollar on that, uh, but it's coming again. <laughs> yeah. As sure as you're born, how about that? It's coming again. Yes, but I want to encourage you that if you can remember what the Lord has brought you through here at Gordon Conwell, and you can remember this hour of joy, you will be able to count it all joy. In that hour, you'll be able to stand flat-footed and you'll be able to say with confidence to your trials and in the midst of your trials, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning, amen? So as we bid our spiritual family at Gordon Conwell farewell, rejoice for your hour has come. I bless you all in the name of Jesus and I bid you farewell, amen. I cannot believe that you made me follow Sister Hatcher. <laughs> Just so you know, somebody kept touching me as if to say, I'm praying for you, you're gonna need it. <laughs> President Hollinger, Dean Harden, distinguished faculty, honored guests, families, and my beloved colleagues. My name, as I've been introduced, is David Wright, and as of tomorrow, I will be a graduate of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Now, I mention this because certainly we are all going to be graduates, but I am one of the longest matriculating students at the Boston campus. <laughs> I figured out that I've been a student so long I should be eligible for tenure by now. <laughs> but when you have a family and ministry and work full time, one personal tragedy can derail you for a very, very long time. And gratefully, people like our pastors and our spouses are there to get us back on track. And for this reason, I'm grateful to my wife, Shelby, and to my pastor, Dr. Roberts, for helping me to get back on track. Now, I've been given the task of representing the Boston campus of Gordon-Conwell by presenting, quote, an address of no more than five minutes, end quote. While I am certainly grateful for this tremendous privilege, I also have a deep appreciation for the near impossibility of my task. My fear is not that I cannot limit my remarks to five minutes, no, I'm probably the shortest winded black preacher you will ever meet. <laughs> no, my difficulty lies in having someone like me, just a guy from Roxbury, purporting to represent a group of students as broad, diverse, deep, and rich as those that comprise the Boston campus. For those who've not had the privilege of visiting the Boston campus, allow me a few moments to do, as every good preacher should, to give you some context for my remarks. Located in the center of Roxbury, which is the geographic center of Boston, lies the Boston campus of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Known as the Center for Urban Ministerial Education, we are in a very real sense part of the fulfillment of Micah, the fourth chapter, second verse, which reads, many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. 
at CUM, as we call it, we are many nations. We are from the countries of Asia and the countries of South America. We are from the countries of Africa and the countries of the Caribbean. We are from North America and descendants of those from many European countries. We speak many different languages and various dialects of those languages. Walking between classes or hanging out in the student lounge, you are just as likely to hear a conversation in Korea, Korean as you are in French or Spanish or even on occasion English. In fact, we've become so comfortable with the diversity of tongues and languages that I actually have to remind myself that I don't actually speak Korean or Japanese or Spanish. And we are in all facets of ministry. We, what we learn in class on Monday night is likely to be implemented by Sunday morning in church. We are mothers and fathers. We are husbands and wives. We are grandparents. We work part-time and full-time. We do ministry part-time and full-time. We try to spend time with our families. And on occasion, on occasion, we even manage to obey the fourth commandment and get some rest. So for one person, just a guy from Roxbury to purport to represent so many cultures, languages, ethnicities, occupations, and positions is in a very real sense ludicrous. But I assume that that's why they asked me to speak, having been trained as a lawyer and a litigator at that, I am quite comfortable with attempting the ludicrous. <laughs> so in the few moments remaining to me, let me make my address in the form of a few observations. And being a good Baptist, I will of course make my observations in three points. My first observation is that the Center for Urban Ministerial Education is just that, a center. Not a center like a shopping center, a place where multiple services are located for convenience. No, CUM is a center like Wall Street is a center for financial transactions, like Hollywood is a center for making movies, like Nashville is the center for music, like Silicon Valley is the center for high tech. If you want to be good in those industries, those are the places where you go. If you want to excel in urban ministry, CUME is where you come. Proof, if proof were needed, is the fact that people are already coming from all over the world to learn urban ministry there. My second observation is that CUME is, a place, CUME is placed in a missiologically strategic location at an eschatologically strategic time. Now I should get an A just for crafting that sentence. <laughs> and extra credit for saying it correctly. <laughs> now, anyone who's ever spoke to me for more than a few moments knows that I am firmly convinced that Boston is ground zero for the next great move of God regionally, nationally, and globally. I fully appreciate that there may be some of you here who disagree with that, and that's okay. You've been wrong before. <laughs> but as Dr. Michael Lindsay, the president of Gordon College, in whose chapel we now worship, has said, the greatest number of national movements in America have come out of two cities. One is San Francisco, and the other is, of course, Boston. The Reverend Lawrence A. Ward, currently the longest serving black pastor in Cambridge, Massachusetts, has observed that 85% of the world's leaders will come through that area that we call Greater Boston for some form of education. The Emanuel Gospel Center has documented that the longest recorded revival, the so-called quiet revival, is occurring in Boston as we speak. We are the center for medicine and teaching hospitals. We are the center for education. We are a center for biotech. I am convinced beyond all peradventure that God has placed Gordon Conwell at the center of Boston at this time to send us forth into all the world with his life-changing gospel. My final observation and then a recommendation. My fellow students, in the variety of cultures, diversity of ethnicity, and multiplicity of experiences, that's another A-plus sentence. <laughs> we have learned and developed our missiology and our theology. Not limited to a single cultural perspective, we see Christ in a fuller, more global sense. Not just America's Messiah, we know that he is Lord and Savior of every nation, of every people, every kindred, and every tongue. And it is with this more international, this more global perspective of God and his kingdom work that we now leave Gordon Conwell to answer the songwriter's question, how great is our God? Allow me to close with this recommendation. To my colleagues, we have learned from and been poured into by some of the greatest theological minds of our generation. You may think that I'm gilding the lily here, but I defy you to find theologians better than those that graced the halls of Gordon Conwell. 
but having learned from them, perhaps having developed and refined our theology with their and with each other's help, we may risk going forth into the world as if we have all the answers and they have all the problems that need to be solved. May I humbly suggest that we don't do God's work this way. Instead, may I offer you a charge that I recently heard given by another preacher. Let us go forth as beggars, trying to tell other beggars where we found sustenance. Let us go forth as the injured and broken, trying to tell other injured and broken where we found healing. And let us go forth as sinners, simply trying to show other sinners where we found redemption and salvation. God bless you. President Hollinger, distinguished faculty, members of the Board of Trustees, friends and family, fellow members of the class of 2016. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Congratulations. Together, by the grace of God, we've made it. Back in December 2009, the leadership of Gordon Conwell and the President Office have delegated Dr. Alvin Pedia, who was then Dean of the Boston Campus, together with Dr. Carlo Ducas Celeste, to explore the possibility for Gordon Conwell to contribute in advancing Christian higher education in Haiti. The team met with a group of pastors at Plaza Hotel in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. The idea was welcomed by all of us. And since then, three major evangelical institutions gathered together to respond to the call to better prepare academically to better serve. Less than three weeks later, Haiti has been devastated by an unprecedented earthquake, January 12, 2010, in which more than 300,000 people lost their lives and left damages for years to come. Needless to say, for many of us who lived this atrocity, we were left speechless. However, we knew that God is faithful and he would not deny himself. We believed that he would show us how to continue to serve him in such a time like this. As it is commonly said, the Lord knows the way in the wilderness. All we have to do is to follow him. In December to 2011, we received words from the Demon Office that the Haiti cohort was due to launch with a group of 14 students made of four different denominations. The goal was simple, to encourage excellence in teaching, shape the mind and skills of those devoted evangelical leaders of Christian higher education in Haiti. Different leaders, seminary president, denomination president, and faculty members of those two distinguished evangelical institutions are among the recipients tonight. We were convinced that the demon in pastoral skills would meet a real need and fill a huge gap in Christian higher education in Haiti. For many in the past years, to accomplish such a milestone, they had to leave their ministry and family in Haiti to come to the US to pursue higher education. As for us, by the grace of God, Gordon Conwell came to Haiti to prepare us to meet the challenges of our community 
after 200 years since the gospel arrived in Haiti in 1816. Today is a great day in the history of the evangelical churches in Haiti. What an achievement. Together with the rest of our fellow candidates, we have completed all the requirements for the commencement. What a joy to be part of the class of 2016 of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And what an honor for me to be the voice of us all, to thank God and to thank all of you who made it possible for this weekend to be a reality. On behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you to you all, faculty and staff, friends and family, for your contribution to make this day possible. Allow me to give special thanks to the trustees, to the president, to Dr. David Curry, to the Dimin office, to our distinguished and most beloved mentor and lead teacher, Dr. Karen Mason, to the Haiti, to the Haiti cohort liaison, Dr. Carlo Ducas Celestin. To you, our professors, Dr. Scott Gibson and Dr. J. Michel Sinfor, you have made great sacrifices to go to Haiti several times to teach us and lead us in this training. And you also made it possible for us to be here on campus for our last residency. In three residencies, we have learned how to better serve our people in our role of pastors and teachers. And when sometimes we were about to be discouraged, these formidable men and women of God encouraged us to press on and to give our best for the glory of God. After the first two residencies, we knew ourselves better and we became better counselors than we were before. Dr. Gibson and Dr. Curry in the third residency sharpened our skills in preaching that connects with the mind and the hearts of the people of God. Our minds were refreshed on how to preach sermons that are faithful to the text and relevant to our audience. The writing of the thesis project was a real challenge. At the beginning, it was frightening to even think about it. But with the patience of our mentor, our reader, and our thesis reviewers, it turned to be an exciting experience. We can say that the program has challenged us beyond our widest imagination and expectations. In working hard to complete this program, one thing that serves us as a real motivation is the advice of Apostle Paul to Timothy, fulfill your ministry, 2 Timothy 4.5. We understood that, firstly, to fulfill our ministry we need to focus on a proper understanding of ministry. For some people, ministry is any activity that we do voluntarily, that is to say, without a salary. Instead, we believe that ministry is a service. We are in the ministry because we are exercising our spiritual gifts for the glory of God and for the edification of his people. The curriculum of the Dimin program, as well as the attitude of our mentors, helped us shape this view of the ministry. Secondly, to fulfill our ministry, we need to balance our relationship with God, our family, our ministry, and the exercise of academic discipline. The learning covenant 
that we prepared at the beginning of the program was instrumental in helping us keep this balance. For it was a requirement that we set some goals in each of these areas, individual goals, family goals, ministry goals, and that we wrote a study plan. By the grace of God, at the end of this experience, four years later, our families are in good health. Our ministries are making some impacts in our communities, and our personal relationship with God is much more authentic. To God alone be the glory for the things he has done. Amen. Today, we understand that this is a commencement in which we will embark. We endeavor to do so with our eyes on God, with the challenges that we had received from our instructors and the models of sacrificial services, we have benefited from them. We respond to a call to serve the Lord with a higher sense of excellence, to prepare men and women of the next generation to advance the kingdom of God. Thank you all for listening. Congratulations to you, class of 2016. Thank you.